even though my watch says it's not quarter past who started, because I've already lost 10 seconds of this session. So uh, I'm going to get going nice and fast. Uh, I'm Robin Niblett, um, associated distinguished fellow at Chatham House, uh, senior advisor with Hacklett, and uh, just thrilled to be moderating uh, this last session. And great to see so many people here. Uh, this is the Hardy crew, um, so wonderful. Uh, but I think it's also uh, a testament to the topic. Um, and a testament to the great panel we've got. So uh, welcome to the panelists as well. Thank you for being here on, on uh, Friday morning. Um, we're going to talk about uh, decrypting the US-China relationship. Um, obviously, when you do stuff on US-China, you're always having to find a new uh, uh, title in. But I think decrypting is quite good, as we were discussing in the, uh, uh, the kind of planning green room before this. It implies we don't know. We don't know where it's going. We're not quite sure what's driving it. Um, hence the need to decrypt it. And uh, we've got a great team uh, here to decrypt it. Um, certainly, uh, on the one hand, it seems bad. Um, and we know the reasons for that, whether they're, and there's some debate, is it ideological, is it economic, is it military, is it a contest of great powers? Um, but we also know there's a lot of effort being put um, by both sides into trying to uh, calm things down. Um, and obviously the meeting that took place on the margins of the APEC uh, summit back in mid-November uh, with President Xi and Biden was that moment. Um, but even since then, <laughs> uh, there seems to be some, let's call it negative normality, uh, restating itself. So this is what we want to uh, uh, decrypt with the panel uh, next to us here. I'm going to do very quick introductions first, so I don't have to introduce as we go along. Um, uh, we're going to run this along. I'm going to try to hold 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. But even though it's coming towards the end of the program, um, they're going to be moving us on, bang on time, I'm sure, at 11 o'clock. On my left, Graham Allison, uh, Douglas Stillen Professor uh, at uh, Harvard Kennedy School, of which he is the founding dean. Um, importantly, as in America, plenty of government experience as well, Assistant Secretary uh, of Defense President Clinton, and advisor to various, well, all Secretaries of Defense, I think up to Mattis is what I saw on the, on the thing. And of course, importantly, author of the very now renowned book, Destined for War, Can My America and China Escape Thucydides' Trap? Um, Mohammed uh, uh, Chati Basri is the former finance minister uh, of Indonesia, um, now chair uh, and, and former chair of, of the Investment Coordinating Committee, chair of PT Bank Madiri, and also now uh, chair of the Pandemic Fund. Um, and he's on the board of the Lee Kuan Yew School, which uh, uh, I think, therefore, we're going to call on you for that broader view. Uh, and Danny Kwa is here, of course. Uh, so uh, that would be fantastic to, to get your viewpoints. Uh, uh, Jin Kayu, Kayu, wonderful to have us, uh, you with us, Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics, uh, author of the New China Playbook, Beyond Capitalism and Socialism, um, and uh, advising lots of companies as well as, I think, the World Bank and IMF on how to decrypt where things are going. Ishwar Prasad, to, his left, uh, to her left, uh, Professor of Trade Policy at Cornell, um, has a chair also in International Economics at the Brookings Institution. I think you all know because we read a lot of Ishwar's uh, stuff in the, in the public uh, press. Um, so fantastic, Ishwar, to have you with us. And Fred Hu, founder, chair, and CEO uh, of uh, Primavera Capital, um, led some very strategically and well-timed investments in Alibaba, uh, Ant Capital, uh, ByteDance, um, former partner and chair of Greater China for Goldman Sachs, um, and uh, former economist at the IMF. Uh, so uh, Hong Kong knows very well. Great panel. We're going to jump in. Um, let me turn to you first, uh, Graham. Um, where do you stand on the getting better or worse uh, situation? How do you read the effort that took place in San Francisco? Um, looking now even at the Philippines situation, the South China Sea, Taiwan election, so much water under the bridge already. What's your take? Just a quick two, three minutes. Kick us off. Okay. Thank you very much. And it's an honor to be part of such a distinguished panel. Uh, it's complicated. And <laughs> if things don't seem confusing, you haven't begun to understand them yet. Okay, so nonetheless, let me make three points. First, are things getting better or worse? The answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the place to start is with the, uh, st the structural realities. Mm -hmm. And the structural realities are that China is a rapidly rising power. The U.S. is a colossal ruling power. When a rapidly rising power seriously threatens to displace a ruling power, 
<laughs> shit happens. So that's basically <laughs> it's Friday morning. One. Yep. Uh, and uh, as I wrote in a book in 2017 about this subject, uh, looking to the future, expect things to get worse before they get worse. <laughs> I think that's a pretty good projection. And I think, unfortunately, going forward, that's a pretty good projection. So 75% of what we're seeing is baked into the structural realities of a rapidly rising China that is seriously threatening a colossal ruling U.S. A U.S. that's proud of the fact that it's constructed an international order that's actually been quite remarkably successful in giving us 78 years without great power war, 78 years without another use of nuclear weapons, but an environment in which the world has seen greater increases in well-being. So there's lots of reasons why this is, for every reason of history, a structural Thucydides right. rivalry. Uh, uh, and when you say, second, you th oh, sorry, second, point, second keep going, point, yeah. second point is, I believe, unfortunately, that's only if that was it, it would be simple. <laughs> okay? Unfortunately, that's only half of the problem. Yep. The other half of the problem is that this is occurring in the particular objective conditions of the 21st century, yep. in which, if you ask the question, which should actually be more compelling for rational actors in Beijing and Washington, the incentives to compete. Yep which are all the reasons of history, or alternatively, the incentives to cooperate. Actually, I give students a, a test. I say right on the top of the first page, incentives to compete. And if you can't make 10 bullet points, be ashamed <laughs> of you. Turn the sheet over, though, incentives to cooperate. And if you can't make 10 bullet points, again, yeah. you go back and think harder. The survival of the US, yep. or the survival of China, requires no nuclear war between the U.S. and China. Well, but for my survival depends on it, that's a pretty powerful incentive to compete. If we live in an enclosed biosphere in which one party's greenhouse gas emissions is, goes into the same pot with the yep. others, if on the current trajectory we're going to make a biosphere none of us can live in, yep. my survival requires figuring out a way to cooperate to with cooperate. you. Exactly. So when I can go on down the list. So I think these, the... the, the, the uh, the, the tension between yep. the incentives to cooperate and the incentives to, to compete are the ones that people are still trying to get their head around. And yep. then to your, to your San Francisco point, which is the third point, San Francisco is very important. Uh, I think what it reflected was two adults, uh, Biden and Xi, who understand this is the most important relationship in the world, that it's going to be fundamentally rivalrous but that there's a necessity for them to find ways to cooperate. Right. And the fact that they took out four hours to talk privately, candidly, about the most delicate issues, and that we don't even know all the things they talked about. But if I watch and see what's happened since then, if I look with respect to Taiwan and the mm -hmm. Taiwanese election, if I look to the rules of engagement that the Chinese have been operating under in the South China Sea uh, recently and in the Straits, if I look at the mill-to-mill -mill conversation, if I look to like, what's happening with fentanyl supply chain, they actually made specific progress on particular items. But the most important was that they agreed that uh, they were not going to misunderstand each other. Right. Now, obviously, there's some real differences, but they were let, not going to let misunderstandings drag them where they didn't want to be. And as she said it in the conversation, if you have an issue, just pick up the phone. <laughs> well, that's pretty remarkable. That's what adults yep. should do about particular issues. So I'm, I'm positive about 2024. I would say chances of war between U.S. and China 2024 99% uh, against chances of war, chances of military conflict over Taiwan, 2024, 99% against. Now, looking further, that's more complicated. I'm glad you can give us one year without war. <laughs> um, but, uh, and I think a lot of those uh, more uh, firm timelines that have been given by certain American military officials yeah. We're in 25, so we might come back to that uh, in a minute and, and just see where we want to go with that. Mohammed, let me come to you uh, next. Um, I was going to say, you know, a view probably from the region in which a lot of this competition is playing out, the competition that uh, Graham just described to us. Um, how does that look? You know, you've got China leading the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, at least getting that off. That's a positive. But we're seeing, in particular with the Philippines right now, some actually pretty sharp uh, competition that has military dimensions to it, should we put it. So could you give us your take uh, uh, on this balance? Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me in this very distinguished uh, panelist. 
I'm not so sure where I can give my response in two or three minutes to <laughs> answer this very complex situation. But let me start by uh, saying that for the Southeast Asian economies, we don't have the luxury to choose between US and China. And that's important because uh, China is one of our largest trading partners. It's very significant impact on the trade and economy in Southeast Asia. The second one, if you look at on the many Southeast Asian economies, uh, China has the long-standing uh, investment present in so many sectors in yeah. Southeast Asia. Um, and of course, this may uh, have an implication if we, if uh, ASEAN should take side, either with go with China or the U.S., but I get the impression that maybe uh, uh, the policymaker in in Washington is a bit difficult to understand our position here. Yeah, um, but at the same time, we also understand that there are a couple of issues that are very sensitive to Southeast Asia. You mentioned about this South China Sea and an expansionary of the Chinese policy, for example. That is why the geopolitical balances uh, in Southeast Asia uh, are needed. Uh, well, I have to say that this U.S. tension have this, I hate to say this, but this will uh, have the positive implication for some Southeast Asian countries mm. because the relocation of the supply chain from China into countries like Vietnam, to Indonesia, to Singapore, uh, etc. But I think the fragmentation, the cost of fragmentation is still very big for us with the techno-nationalism, the economic security, and this will have an impact on the, on the supply chains. So under this kind of situation, as I said that uh, ASEAN, we don't have the luxury to choose. The solution is uh, what can be done to solve this problem. I'm, I'm being realistic. I'm humbled by the political reality. I always like to quote what Jean-Claude Juncker said, we all know what to do, we just don't know how to get reelected after we've done it, right? So, so the question is, what can be done at the given political and institutional constraint? The first one is you mentioned about the RCEP. RCEP itself is not led by China. The idea is uh, there is no single ASEAN countries can deal bilaterally with China. That is why we need agency. We need an entity in which that ASEAN become a hub. So the idea is to have ASEAN with China, ASEAN with Japan, with Korea, and the US. Of course, the challenge is about the leadership in Southeast Asia. We can, we can discuss this about the later on. That's one thing. The other thing is try to look at about, and I can give an example of it, uh, try to find the common denominator in which everybody around the table can work together. So let me give an example when Indonesia hosted the G20 a meeting in 2022. The tension was so heat related to the Ukraine issue, etc. So, but we tried to find an issue that everyone around the table, everybody around the table, will agree to sit together. And the issue was pandemic, mm. because if you're talking about health issue, if you're talking about pandemic, you know, Russia, China, U.S. will agree to sit together. Now, I'm a co-chair of the pandemic fund. We've been able to. You know, to mobilize about to seed capital, about two billion US dollar allocated funding. Last time, 350 for 37 countries for grants, and the next will be 500 uh, million US dollar. So the idea is try to find the common denominator. Maybe on the climate issue, maybe the joint research yep. between Beijing and Washington. Yeah, try to look at the the the, the collaboration. At the same time, ASEAN uh, also need to improve their bargaining position through the the, uh, the RCEP. And the other thing is diversification. Yeah, not to rely so much, even though I know this is easier to be said than done, but try to diversify. But one thing, if I can say about the, pand uh, the pandemic fund, the ability to sit together somehow to me is a reflection of the testament to the multilateralism. So I live in here. Well, great, thanks for the, those opening points. And we can come back to, you said, some later on, uh, in particular, the kind of influence uh, Southeast Asia is trying to have collectively building up some uh, joint capacity to uh, negotiate with China. Um, KU, let me come to you next. One of the big phrases uh, that the Biden administration has tried to use to define a pragmatic approach has been uh, Jake Sullivan's, you know, we're going to build a small yard with a high fence uh, for technology corporations, an area I know you work on a lot. So I suppose my question to you would be, 
is that definition working? Um, is that creating some sort of guardrails uh, under which a more cooperative relationship or competition, as we had in one of the panels earlier on, could uh, uh, emerge? Or do you feel, in a way, that fence is just porous and the, you know, the yard keeps enlarging and no one's quite sure what its definition is because there's something inevitable about the technological competition? Your take. So um, at the core of it, uh, US-China competition is about the China model, development model, Chinese aspirations, and uh, most of all, Chinese uh, technology or technological competition. I think it's as bad it is uh, because of a lack of mutual trust and very different world vision, values, and culture, which I think we underappreciate. President Xi recently said, we hope that America would be prosperous and hope that U.S. would wish China to be more prosperous as well. <laughs> I think that does uh, send a message. But I do think that the two countries are recalibrating the relationship, mm. learning from what's ha what has happened. I don't really think there's a set, specific idea of how it's going to look like. And recalibration comes from two, two important things, I think. First of all, is that internal challenges for both countries, China for sure, on the economic side, uh, political side, military, and so forth. A lot of the focus is now inward. Chinese don't think about Americans all day long. Uh, <laughs> um, but also, second, there's a huge unintended consequence of these technological restrictions, coming back to your technology question. We've seen it in history. We've seen that whenever there are restrictions or um, uh, um, kind of um, walls, uh, it accelerates technological development. So what we have seen in China recently is a national mobilization. Unlikely partners from the big techs working together, uh, university, industries, governments, all trying to tack tackle the hard and impossible. And that's totally accelerated some of the endeavors to leapfrog. And I think that we're going to see much more of that mm. because of these restrictions, not despite them. Um, and uh, we've already seen some of the, 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 the uh, you know, they were before, they were comfortably importing uh, chips. They, of course, Chinese companies would love just to import NVIDIA chips. Now they have to turn to domestic substitution. Yeah. And that's accelerating, and that's making domestic chip companies much more profitable and in many, many different areas. And of course, it's leaky. You cannot really restrict technology flows, and you're basically enriching the intermediaries. I, you know, there are a lot of third countries from where we're seeing a huge surge in imports of chips. I wonder what happened there. Um, so collaborative competition, I think, is the way we should define the relationship. Look, U.S. and Japan had a similar competition, economic technology competition. And guess what happened? Everybody was better off because mm -hmm. Japan pushed the U.S. to do much more. Lots of these really important, um, uh, 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 you know, kind of uh, important innovation pushes were were because of Japanese competition. The two biggest uh, themes this year, AI and sustainability, one represents competition between the two, the second rep represents uh, collaboration. There's no way we're gonna get to green transition without the collaboration of the two. So my advice would be, first of all, start from small victories to build trust. I think we've already seen a little bit of that. Anthony Binkley has mentioned some of that, and uh, recalibrate and readjust uh, to real-time circumstances. Thank you very much, uh, KU, for that. And again, let people uh, come back to them maybe in, in, in the next set of remarks, because um, it does strike me, as you said, technology is probably one of the defining elements of the 21st century. Graham was pointing to the opportunities for positive cooperation through it, but technology is the other defining element that may uh, sharpen the competition, uh, despite everything you, you were just saying there. Ishwa, let me come to you next. I mean, you're based in the US uh, between Cornell and, and, and DC. You've got a lot of experience um, of, of what it's undertaking there. I'm just wondering. Uh, to what extent is America trying to unpick a form of interdependence that it acquired there because of the structural nature of the competition that we've described so far? Um, do you think, like as strategic as decision has been taken across all fronts of U.S. policy decision making, that we've got to pull back from the intent, you know, the close relationship we had? Um, and does that mean that, therefore, we're going to end up with a kind of much more separated economy? Or not? Is it also part of an area where we can have cooperation? Well, Robin, when I saw the title Decrypting the US-China Relationship, given my work on digital currencies, my immediate question was, who the heck encrypted it? <laughs> or what caused the encryption to take place? Now, that may be a little too cute by half, but certainly things have been getting worse. 
So to butcher the analogy a little further, mm -hmm. it's worth thinking about what is the algorithm underlying the, the deterioration in the relationship. And I think of characterizing this relationship along multiple fronts. And again, to take a somewhat simplistic view about this, there were two elements that were crucial in terms of keeping the relationship between these two countries in balance. Now, if you think about the geopolitical aspects of the relationship, as Graham has correctly pointed out, this is ultimately a zero-sum relationship. One country gains, another country has to lose. And that would seem inherently bound for conflict. But there was a period, a fairly long period, when the economic relationship between the two countries was seen as a positive sum game. And my sense is that that element kept the overall relationship in balance. Because while the geopolitical relationship clearly could not be moved to a positive sum aspect, the economic relationship was seen as important enough so that you could maintain balance between the two. Things have changed. Even the economic relationship is now seen as a zero-sum game, or indeed, in certain areas that are important to both economies, is seen as a negative-sum game. So the question is, what is the dynamic that has shifted that has changed this relationship? Now, I've been an academic for about 17 years, and I've been dealing with various US administrations in various informal advisory capacities. And in the US, I've noticed one thing, that the political part of the administration, which is typically the White House, the National Economic Council, the National Security Council, has tended to take a harder line towards China on the economic as well as national security and geopolitical fronts. Treasury tends to be the balancing force here. And what was Treasury representing? In a sense, it was American businesses, American financial institutions that were very eager to maintain a positive relationship with China because they saw China as very important as a market, as a cog in their supply chains, and as very important to their overall business model because China remains a very large and important and growing market. That has shifted in a fundamental way. Speaking to corporate leaders, leaders of financial institutions, I sense the promise that they had anticipated that China would open up its markets, would allow them to compete in a free and fair way domestically, has not panned out. And what we've seen is that that coalition does not really work that well anymore. Now, even that coalition was a little fragmented. If you think about the National Association of Manufacturers in the US, they represented companies that felt threatened by China. But there were enough companies and institutions on the other side who saw opportunity in China that kept this in balance. But across the board right now, things have shifted. There has been a disillusionment that China has not lived up to its promises, that China is providing a somewhat more hostile environment for businesses operating there, trying to sell into China's market. So that, I think, is a fundamental shift. Professor Danny Kwa, the other day at a dinner, referred to economics eating geopolitics. So this is a slightly different characterization, but it goes along the same theme. For a while, the two were actually balancing each other out. That has now gone. I think both of them are sort of chasing each other's tail, to push Danny's analogy a little further. There is an additional complication that has arisen, and KU has correctly alluded to this. There is domestic politics as well as domestic economics that now has added to the mix and made it much more toxic and volatile. So at this stage, if you're thinking of decrypting as basically coming back to a period when even in terms of economics, one could see this as a positive sum game, I think there are some avenues where that can take place. But on a broad front, that is going to be difficult to do. Well, we're decrypting in, in a negative direction. I can sense that uh, already. I mean, balance is the best we're able to hope for at the moment. Fred, um, yeah, this means, must seem a little bit bleak uh, to you. And I'm just wondering, uh, especially with the references Ishwa made to financial institutions and the kind of belief that was held by even companies like Goldman Sachs at a particular time that there were real opportunities there in the market. Um, how do you see it? How, how important is, how is China's own development, its economic development internally, to the balance of this conversation? And how much do you agree or disagree in particular with the last uh, uh, two sets of comments by KU and Ishwa? Thank you, Robin. <laughs> Without any doubt, uh, the China-US relationship is a defining challenge of our lifetime. And for people in this room and our children, 
it, it was likely the most critical factor determining whether you know, we'll be living in a world uh, of peace and the possibility or war and the conflict. Um, you know, the, the relationship between US and China, while so important, has been taken notice dive from bad to worse, you know, for many different uh, uh, reasons, some been uh, articulated by my fellow panelists. But I also think to a large degree, um, is caused by false narratives, uh, wrong assumptions, and um, uh, unsubstantiated uh, uh, acrimonious uh, accusations. Um, you know, for the particular, I think the, um, um, you know, this is sort of the competitive relationship. For many of us in business, in, in finance, we know, why right? competition generally is a good thing. That's really the source of efficiency and uh, value creation. But uh, right now, when the relationship is framed, you know, as a competitive relationship, it's really, as each of it's really viewed as zero sum or worse, negative sum uh, game, okay? And on top of it, increasingly, where normal, ordinary uh, trade of goods and services and technology and data are also viewed almost exclusively from a national security lens, okay? Um, so then it's very hard to have a balanced, carefully calibrated, uh, healthy, sustainable relationship. You know, if just everything you look at it is national security, you see it as a threat, right? So then you have a knee-jerk reaction, you know, xenophobic re reaction. And, um, you know, some of the tools like uh, curb on advanced semiconductors, okay? If it's truly carefully covered as a small yard and high fence, I guess for most of us, probably life goes on uh, unaffected. But the hard truth is, you know, I, I assume many of you are like me, I have a house, I have a front yard and, this, and, and the backyard. Those yards are really, really small because even I can plant my, uh, my flowers and take care of my lawns. But I think <laughs> the restrictions as they are, uh, enacted, imposed. These are several photobio fields uh, big. That's not hard to code as a small yard, <laughs> okay? And the fences are almost, you know, uh, unreachable and uh, invisible, right? That's also not like a, you know. Um, so that really make hard for the globe, you know, up to for Chinese business, for American business who work with China, and also take the world economy as a collateral damage, right? Businesses, investors, we need a predictable uh, policy regime, domestically and internationally. Right now, there's no certainty. There's no predictability. You know, every day you wake up, you know, some uh, shocks, you know, uh, surprises. So that's not a good position to be. Having said this, however, actually, I don't want to give a sense of uh, uh, doom and gloom. <laughs> I actually feel better than I have been for the last five, six years about the outlook of the bilateral relationship. You know, some factors already mentioned by Graham and others. You know, I, first, I do think the Biden presidency summit in San Francisco has really put the floor underneath the relationship. Okay, that's important. Mm -hmm. On top of it, there's been resumption of, you know, climate talks and the military talks, okay? And the second, you know, last week, before we all are scattered here in Dallas, there was really a consequential election in Taiwan. Okay, just even before that, some of the media commentators, some of the hawks say, well, look, you know, what Putin did to Ukraine, that's what the, uh, Beijing is going to do to Taiwan. Watch out, you know? The election happened in Taiwan. I think it's notable for the absence of drama, okay? Uneventful. Why? Because, you know, I, since February 2022, I get a lot of uh, inquiries from my friends in Europe and North America ask me, Fred, what do you think when Beijing is going to attack Taiwan? <laughs> I used to give a lengthy discussion on history, you know, geography and the culture, why it's not going to happen. Then I really get sick and tired for more than a year trying to say there's no war coming. Then whenever the question comes up, I say, well, no war because China is not Russia. Taiwan is not Ukraine. Okay? So that's a very, very important factor. Now, 
Last most importantly, you know, this is also what the query alluded to. Except I would carry this differently. Curry said, well, you know, the relationship is not going to get even worse because China is turning more inward. I wouldn't use the word inward. In fact, Li Chang just came here. He launched a charm offensive for investors to welcome, come to do business in China, right? So China is not turning inward in the sense of economic strategy or, or development policy. China is open, open up more widely. But what I'm saying, I think Kerry is right. You know, China is single-mindedly focused on domestic economic development as the top national priority. Mm -hmm. Unlike America right now, you know, I'm sure you would know in Washington, D.C., I have a lot of friends like you who live in D.C., there's unhealthy, even dangerous obsession with China, okay? Everything is related to China. I know someone working in an autonomous startup in California, and they were working with Congress trying to come up with a bill about the highway safety when you have autonomous driving vehicles on the roads, right? Commingling with human drivers. So the draft bill, the title is Beat China, Enhance American Highway Safety. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. You know, many American, you know, America is a very polarized society. Many problems, whether it's um, homeless uh, on the street of San Francisco or mass shooting, are all made in America, but oftentimes politicians try to make it in, in, uh, in China. So what I'm saying is as China has to get its own act together, focus on the domestic economy, not to seek a quarrel with the US, I think things just be fine. Okay, you got to optimism at the end, I saw that. Um, <laughs> we've got about four minutes before I want to turn to questions, four or five minutes, so obviously do your best to try and give me telegraphic answers if you can on these questions. But I think there's a natural lead in, uh, Graham, from where Fred was trying to note the optimism, that putting a floor under the relationship, there wasn't the big blowout after Taiwan. What happens if there's a change of uh, administration at the end of 2024 in the US? where those animal spirits, that instinct to put China at the heart of everything, suddenly uh, uh, accelerates. What's your view? I'll give you that killer question. Um, Trump administration type of policy towards uh, China, Taiwan. So given the time, I would just yeah. do one minute, OK? Exactly. So first, I agree with Fred very much on what happened in San Francisco. It's a, pa a floor. But I would say, think of it as a pause button. <laughs> and I think we see a lot of evidence of the pause button. But people are therefore watching fearfully what exactly. happens in 2024. Right. So Biden has one objective in 2024, which is to defeat Trump. Okay? Uh, as the specter of Trump uh, becoming president by this time next year uh, uh, rises, uh, countries everywhere are beginning to factor in what I wrote about this week as a Trump put, mm -hmm. that is taking account of that in their choices and actions now in dealing with the Biden administration. And I think from the Chinese perspective, since, Biden, since Trump has made very clear that uh, he sees China as the principal adversary, his trade advisor, Lighthizer, is very clear about it. He calls it the lethal adversary, that in his administration, he'll start by withdrawing uh, most favored nation trading uh, uh, he'll put on a 10% tariff across the board. He'll do tit for tat tariffs for anything larger. That's for everybody. And that in particular, in relations with China, they will, quote, eliminate dependence uh, for critical materials, including electronics, steel, and pharmaceuticals. So I would say, yikes, you can hardly imagine what that yep. means. Yep. I think Chinese are beginning to think about this, saying, one, could this be real? Yes. Then, if that's were real, as one colleague, a Chinese that I know very well, said, uh, he said, we're beginning to think maybe he would succeed in decoupling the U.S. from the global economy <laughs> more than he would do decoupling us. Mm. So I would say, uh, uh, tighten your seat belts; it's going to get worse, uh, you know, going forward. And I think, in particular, for those of us concerned about the U.S.-China relation, the We've gone into our silly season in, in which Americans, and especially American politicians, are even sillier than normal. And the connection between what they say and what they think or any reality has become completely d detached. And so you will hear more and more 
uh, harsh things about China because nobody gets in trouble for being tougher than their adversary, their competitor about China. And I try to tell Chinese, don't take it personally. This is uh, the theater of American politics. And the one sort of reassuring piece is, be sure Trump and Biden will say worse things about their American competitor than they say about Xi. <laughs> So, uh, thanks very much for that, Graham. And again, I'm trying to go very quickly here. Um, Mohammed. BRICS, G7, is when we're decrypting the relationship, is it a global competition for friends, allies, that kind of leadership? And where do ASEAN countries, where does a country like Indonesia sit on this? I'm not even sure whether you're on that list, uh, you know, that's considering BRICS. Thank you, thank you very much for this. Uh, well, from the Indonesia perspective, we can understand and appreciate some efforts that have been put for some countries to have a, a serious discussion on, on BRICS. Uh, I can understand maybe from the perspective of there is a risk to holding the US dollar because the impact of the sanction. But the way I look at it, this will take very long time before this, uh, this happens. So from the Indonesian perspective, the government has decided not to join the BRICS, but we are aiming to join the OECD to look at, to explore the possibilities still in the advanced states. And I think this is the uh, right move because we need to tie our reform with the international benchmark. Uh, Robin, well, in the case of Indonesia, we, a lot of things need to be done regarding the bureaucratic reform about you know, regulation hurdles. I always call that one of the reasons of why many Indonesians become religious is because we have to deal with the government. <laughs> if you apply, apply for the investment, it's like a black box. There's nothing you can do except pray to God. That's the reason why <laughs> we need to improve the reform. That's why uh, it is very important to benchmark our reform for the like OECD standard, for example. Thank you very much. I've got to keep moving down there. Um, I thought you made a very interesting point, KU, about that maybe part of the competition is about development models. Um, could you just say a word or two more about that? Because that would mean that really it's a structural type of competition and maybe a competition that goes global as well. well um, after uh, reading Jake Sullivan's, you know, uh, reviving national uh, American economy, it sounds pretty much like the China model <laughs> with, uh, with industrial policies and uh, subsidies and a huge national boost. And look, you know, the China model is about having a unique coordination between government and markets. Um, and, uh, you know, individualism and communalism. Um, but look, you know, I think there's one fundamental misunderstanding about the Chinese uh, from the American side, which is, and if it is that, that China's sole goal is to try to overtake the U.S. That is not the Chinese aspiration. Uh, the Chinese people, with a billion people still trying to have a better life, it's overwhelmingly pragmatic. Uh, Chinese people right now still think about getting an apartment in the cities and sending their kids to school. And so that is the ultimate legitimacy, source of legitimacy also for the party. When we talk about war and all that, it's about peace and stability, which is the best conditions to make that happen. Right. Um, so what we're seeing with U.S. and China, I think, again, coming back to the recalibration, look at trade. Yes, U.S. and China structural trade is declining, but guess what's happening? It's just being rerouted from Vietnam and Mexico. But the ultimate sources of demand and supply are still coming from the two largest economy. It's just taking a much longer route and adding to the trade costs. And it's going to add to the cost of innovation, it's going to add to the cost of inflation. And so I think, you know, coming back to the American voters, I believe that ultimately defining the, this year's election is still going to be overwhelming pragmatic about the everyday livelihoods of these people. Yeah. And I suppose there are huge amounts of trade, you know, toys to uh, all sorts of, you know, basic consumer goods, which are at the moment passing beneath that radar. Ishwa, one very specific question to you. You talked about trade potentially suffering at all sorts of levels. What about foreign investment? Do you think... In this political environment you described, the Chinese company thinks, well, you know what, I need to try and gamble with investing in the United States, helping American jobs. This is the traditional route that Japan, European, other countries have taken when they fed, you know, fed, uh, face that kind of uh, American protectionist instinct, is to try to get inside. Is that going to be impossible in the political environment we're in? So first of all, on the broader issue about um, what um, Fred and Graham have characterized as the floor, certainly it's good that there is a floor 
Unfortunately, it is as treacherous as the streets of Davos at the moment. I think it's uh, <laughs> certainly not something one can count on for stability. And stability very often does come from commercial relationships. And as you pointed out, uh, Robin, one could think about investment as being the tool through which these relationships can be broadened. But I think here, um, there is again a problem from the point of view of American businesses. Um, there is a sense of uncertainty about Chinese policies towards the private sector more broadly. Right. This ties into KU's uh, issue about um, China's development model and how that is evolving. There are still some questions about that. But also U.S. policy towards China because the U.S. has been restricting investment. On the flip side, I think there are good reasons for China, again, uh, building on what KU alluded to, for them to invest even in the U.S. in order to try to change a political discourse. But unfortunately, that political discourse is getting distorted um, with Chinese investment seen as essentially uh, being hostile in some way towards uh, the US, even though they may create some jobs. So I don't think we are in a good place yet on that front. The good thing, however, is that on the very big issues on which the two sides need to cooperate, like climate change and so on, it's good to see that there is still some high-level cooperation. So there is a lot that is not good, but at least on the huge issues on which the two sides really need to cooperate, yep. there seems to be some forward progress. Fred, last comment from you. A lot of comments about your floor. Um, any thoughts back in, in reaction before I just grab three or four questions and take them back to you very quickly? Well, based on the floor, as well as the security and the stability, but also there's a lot of upside. You know, with the climate and the global pandemic and coordination. You know, I think if China really uh, learned some of the lessons uh, from the last five years, right? China clearly also made plenty of mistakes domestically and internationally. You know, the wolf warrior diplomacy hardly won in China any friends, but made more en made more enemies. So China now definitely is, you know, cause correction. You know, inter, uh, internationally, trying to make more friends, right? And uh, you know, courting Europe and the consolidating the relation with the uh, global South, you know, Southeast Asia in particular, uh, but uh, you know, Middle East and Africa and uh, and South America. And also, as I expect China in the next few years will also seek really to improve relation with the immediate neighbors, Japan, South Korea, and India. So as China does that, you know, China's image slowly but surely will improve. Trust will be regained. Then, most important is domestic economy. If China really single-minded focused on domestic economy, get back its economic mojo, okay, the vitality, that will become still tremendous magnet for global businesses and investment. Then China is going to have actually a bit more cloud influence without overly competing uh, with, the, uh, with the, uh, Washington uh, for, for global hegemony. I don't think that's China's goal. China's goal is really domestic economic economy. And that's, the hope for me, more upside in okay. the relationship. Thank you very much. Look, we've got a big panel. I'm going to get a horrible look at the end of uh, this thing from the organizers. Um, there's one hand up here. I'm going to take literally three questions. One, two, three. That's it. Very quickly. One here, and there's two at the front there. If somebody can bring the microphone down there. Hello. Very uh, short. Absolutely. From, I'm from Czech Republic. Last six years, I was living in China, Beijing, Hong Kong. I agree with you, Fred. In America, Beijing of China, it's a zeitgeist, but so it is in China. When you look on Global Times, Zen Major Power, how to get out of these rhetorics, Professor Ellison took it this trap of rhetorics, especially now when Chinese macro has so many problems. And the nationalism and propaganda might be a clue. How to break it. Brilliant. Thank you. Nukule Runyembezi from South Africa. I want to go back to this idea uh, that there is a very deep-seated reason for the lack of trust and understanding between the two sides, and you sketched it out quite well, KU, business models, well, not business model, development models, et cetera, et cetera. If one argues from that premise, are we not being naive in mm. thinking that there can be a circumstance in which trust can be rebuilt? Is that not just managing distrust, as somebody put exactly. it, um, is that not the best we can hope for? Thank you. And last uh, question there. Hi, Min Jae from China Daily. Um, we heard so much about uh, US-China relationships from a um, political and international perspective. I, I, I want to ask a simple question. How does the panel um, anticipate that uh, the US-China relationship will impact the daily life of the people, ordinary people in China and the United States? Thank you. <laughs> oh, well. Let's go in reverse order on that one, actually, because that's where you were talking, Fred, about that focus at home. How do you think it'll impact uh, uh, the daily life with the direction that it's been going in so far? You've got each of you 30 seconds. 
Yeah, a bad relationship between US and China definitely is bad for the people in both countries. I don't see anything uh, positive out of it. So a harmonious relationship would certainly serve both countries better and their people much better? Keep borders open, student flows, academics, sure. uh, knowledge flows, and uh, leaders should talk more often. So people to people, eh? very important yeah. point. Communication, continue to, for the research collaboration. I agree with all those, but if I take the question exactly. over here, I would say that the, uh, the rivalry is so deeply baked into the geopolitics that to the attempt to deny it will be self-defeating. But at the same time, if my survival requires cooperation, I'm going to have to learn to cooperate as much as I compete. And that's a contradiction, but I think that's the life that, you know, going forward. So we've de I think we decrypted a lot of the dynamics behind the relationship. Um, it's negative in terms of trust. It's structural in terms of geopolitical competition. But I think there's a sense here from the panel, you've got two big countries trying to work out a way to live with each other. Even if there's a change of administration, hopefully it'll be more theater than action, but we'll wait and see. I was part of a panel yesterday where it sounded pretty blood curdling. <laughs> Could you please thank uh, the great panel here? Thank you for coming. <laughs>